That's true, Dr. Zayas. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show. Greg Carwood Company. How's it going, our side chatters? Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke, and really psyched to talk to today's guest from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood. And folks, we don't have to look too deeply to start noticing the echoes of occultism in the margins of history, whether we're talking about the true nature of ancient sites around the world, the founding of America, or the belief system of the Nazis. It seems like even in some of the most high-profile time periods, the gatekeepers have thoroughly quarantined any reference to the real-life influences of occultism and perhaps the otherworldly influences it conjures up. And although we're left largely in the dark, for what we do know, we owe a huge credit to today's guest, Peter Lavenda, for dedicating a large portion of his life to doing the real work of dragging these hidden aspects out into the light in his wide range of books. From titles like Unholy Alliance and The Hitler Legacy that tackled the little-known aspects of the Nazis before, during, and after the war, to the three dense and detailed works that make up his series Sinister Forces, a grimoire of American political witchcraft that looks at esotericism and what he's termed quantum history in America, and quite honestly connects more dots than a bored kid with chicken pox and a sharpie. I stand in awe of his many impressive accomplishments and amazing personal experiences, and to have him here is a beautiful thing. Peter my man how the hell are you i'm doing great thanks for that intro <laughs> yeah no worries i do what i can but i am uh, really psyched for this you're so knowledgeable in areas that i'm most curious and your work has clarified a ton of confusing material for me and also works to validate this idea we talk about that supernatural forces spiritual entities archons whatever lens you want to look through but forces deeper than what we can see on the surface have a real influence on our world and really shouldn't be ignored And uh, I guess to get us started here, let's start with Sinister Forces. Uh, Talk to us about this overreaching theme of how we find American history to really be a combination of largely unknown events and connections mixed with what appears to be some extra dimensional or spiritual influence. Sure. I mean, that is really the overarching theme. What are the Sinister Forces? We find in history, in American history, that, uh, you know, people have blamed, literally blamed Sinister Forces for the things that have gone on. I took the title from Al Haig. Uh, Alexander Haig had said that the sinister forces were responsible for that 18 and a half minute gap on the Oval Office tapes. And I thought that was a really interesting perspective. You know, what are those sinister forces? Al Haig at one point was running NATO. Hmm. You know, he was our national security advisor. At one point, Al Haig was trying to take over the White House when Nixon was, uh, <laughs> was considered to be either too ill or, you know, in the midst of the, the possibility of impeachment. Mm -hmm. So here's one of the most powerful people in the United States government, you know, in the 1970s, talking about sinister forces. And I thought that's interesting. And then, of course, we had um, Douglas MacArthur talking about sinister forces coming from some other planetary galaxy, you know, Mm -hmm. and screwing with us. So I wanted to know what those were. What did people mean by that? And like most Americans in the 20th century, when, when I started, we came out of this environment where science was everything. You know, science was uh, was perfect. Science uh, had the answers to all of it. Right. But science, for me, um, only answered, you know, half of the equation. There's something else that's, you know, in, essential to, to, the, to the human experience. And science is great for analyzing um, material phenomena, but it's not very good in answering the big cosmic questions, you know, <laughs> why are we here? And, you know, what is our purpose? Do we have a purpose? Um, life after death and, you know, thousands of other things. So I started to look more deeply, what does religion and spirituality have to say about reality itself? What, what does it have to say about the world that we're living in? Does it answer things that science doesn't? And I found traces of this all throughout Uh, American history, focusing just on American history and sinister forces, I found that there was a a thread running through our history where events that are seen to be unrelated are actually deeply related to each other. And there's the connective tissue is usually something so totally bizarre and so totally (laughs) off the wall that, of course, we ignore it. We ignore it because we don't know how to to confront it it's a little, a little bit like the ufo experience you know right we have to ignore it because we can't explain it 
since we can't explain it, we ignore it. And because we're ignoring it, we can't explain it. It's catch-22. <laughs> yeah. But that, but that's where we are. So we've relied so much on science to answer questions for us um, that we are neglecting an entire aspect of what it is to be to be human. And in some cases, by doing that, we've ignored connective tissue mm-hmm. that exists between political events and political actors that, quite frankly, I found totally baffling and, and totally shocking. I don't even know where to begin with sinister forces, but we talk about coincidence. Coincidence is a very unscientific term, but science will use that term when it can't explain what happened. So take, for instance, the, the Texas Tower shooting, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in Texas, University of Texas, a guy goes up to a tower and starts shooting people. Uh, eventually, a uh, police captain is brought in. The, the shooter is uh, is captured and killed. All kinds of things happen all surrounding this particular event. But people didn't realize that this entire episode had been prefigured in a novel that was published years before, which even got the name of the police captain right, ah. even though he wasn't even in the police department at the time. Um, so what what was that all about? <laughs> you know, how did that happen? Right. It's okay to have like a general idea. Some nut goes onto the top of a tower and starts shooting people. I guess, you know, eventually some novelist would have to come out with that. But to get the name of the police captain right, that's that's absurd. Okay, That's insane. So that prompted me to look further. And naturally, the ties to the Kennedy assassination is was the next you know step in this process of me looking at that and thinking, oh, no, this is not possible. Mm-hmm. These people could not have been involved. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Who's this? You know? <laughs> and connecting the dots, as you said, there's there's a lot of dots out there. But when you start connecting them, it gives you a different picture of reality. It gives you a different picture of what's going on. Like like you mentioned, a kind of quantum approach to history. Mm-hmm. You know, and I always ask people, was the Kennedy assassination a particle or a wave? You know, it depends <laughs> on how you look at it. Was there was there a conspiracy or not? Mm-hmm. You can make a very good case that there was no conspiracy whatsoever, you know, which is what the Warren Commission did with voluminous documents and piles of paperwork. But at the same time, you can make a very good, almost, I would say, airtight case that there was definitely a conspiracy involved, but you're not going to like the details. Mm-hmm. You know, the details of that conspiracy involve things that we generally ignore and we don't want to look at. Um, and it involves spirituality. It involves weird churches. It involves a bunch of people thinking they were in contact with a UFO in Maine in 1952. <laughs> you know, it has all of these connective threads and they all point directly at the assassination. How is that possible? And when I started looking at that and, you know, I began to stop and say, OK, let's look at a history. Let's just focus on American history, because this phenomenon is true for, for all history, basically around the world. But let's just start with American history and see where it leads us. And that, you know, led to Sinister Forces. It's just it's three volumes, you know, and as you mentioned, it's pretty dense. Yeah. You know? I have to apologize for that. But that was the only way to really make a case mm-hmm. was to pile on the evidence the way the Warren Commission did. Yeah. You know. You got to do the same thing and, and use their tools against them, essentially, and say, okay, we're going to take a Warren Commission approach to this. Let's just pile in the documentation. Show me, you know, where it's wrong. Maybe you don't like my interpretation or the spin that I put on these things. But if you just look at the documents themselves, there's nothing you can do to, to disavow it. Mm-hmm. We did have a bunch of people meeting in the woods in Maine in 1952, <laughs> you know, having a seance contacting a saucer that was hovering over the planet. And 10 years later, these same people are involved in the Kennedy assassination. Mm -hmm. I mean, directly involved in the Kennedy assassination, you know, not sort of really weird peripherally. This one knew that one knew this one knew that one. I'm talking about two handshakes away. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable. It's very trippy. And I do want to talk about those threads and JFK and the seance, but let's just back up for a bit because the Sinister Forces trilogy It covers so much ground, and one area that really blew my mind was just all the relics and the evidence of a rich pre-Columbian history that our culture really refuses to acknowledge. And to quote the first book in the series, you say, There is an ancient America that lurks beneath the threshold of our collective corn-fed consciousness. And I, I really love that. I think you're spot on. And it's also interesting if you put any stock in the idea of spiritual forces influencing particular places or areas geographically, it would be pretty important to learn the pre-Columbian history, yet we know very little. 
But, you know, of the things that you've learned about this ancient America, what have you found most interesting? Well, the fact that you can look at our continent, uh, at North America, uh, with the same wonder that you can look at the Middle East, for instance, Egypt or Mesopotamia or Stonehenge in England or, or the, the vast temples in, in Mexico and Guatemala and Honduras. I mean, North America is replete with ancient monuments. And because they were made of earth, instead of being made of stone, we kind of didn't see them mm -hmm. for a long time. Uh, some people did, and some people made drawings of them, and they excavated there totally amateurishly, probably ruined a lot of data, ruined a lot of information that way. But it's it, it's there's no doubt that we had ancient civilizations in in the North American continent. And they were capable of just the same degree of sophistication in creating their earthworks as the Egyptians were in building their pyramids, as an example. They were just as capable. In fact, uh, some of the mounds, because they were a mound builder culture, they just built earthen mounds. Some of the mounds are actually larger and have more volume than the, the pyramids of Egypt, mm. than the Great Pyramid. We're talking about people who are very sophisticated. Uh, the, serp the Serpent Mound is a good example of and astro astronomically oriented earthworks. Uh, the people had the same ideas about, um, you know, adjusting their life and building their life around uh, cosmic cycles. All of this was there. They just simply didn't leave much in the way of writing behind. Mm -hmm. But they did develop this very active civilization. And I was drawn to this accidentally. I had absolutely no knowledge of it, like most Americans. You you walk over these mounds not knowing that you're taught you're walking over the remains of an ancient civilization. And I was drawn to it through accident. I was researching Charles Manson, <laughs> of all things. So I decided to go to Charlie's uh, hometown, basically. Uh, the the birth certificate says he was born in Cincinnati, but he grew up in Ashland, Kentucky. So I said, okay, let me go there. I just want to see the environment. Manson was kind of the the touchstone for all of this, because Manson seemed to combine in himself a lot of these same elements that I was concerned about. I mean, he was uh, Scientology clear, you know, on one hand. Mm -hmm. uh, he ran, he was responsible, of course, for the Manson family uh, murders on the other, but there was so much other stuff going on. He was at, you know, Boys Town, for crying out loud. He was <laughs> in all sorts of places. And I just wanted to see it for myself. Um, so using Manson as kind of the way into the story about American history, I drove down uh, from Rhode Island, where I was living at the time, and all the way down to, to Ashland, Kentucky, um, and realizing that so many towns in West Virginia and Kentucky and Northern Virginia were homes to some of the world's most, or some of our country's most infamous serial killers. And I thought, well, that's something weird right there. Let me let me just soak in the atmosphere, you know, <laughs> see what this is all about. Maybe it's the water. You know? yeah. so I drove to, to Ashland and, you know, right in the middle of the town where Charles Manson grew up, uh, went to school when he went to school and all the rest of it is a park. It's called Central Park. And in the middle of the town, there are these Indian burial mounds. I mean, they're they're large enough that, you know, they're quite visible. They're quite you know obvious. And there was a plaque there saying that, you know, the mounds were actually excavated by a Boy Scout troop or some damn thing. <laughs> um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking, what is this all about? So I start researching the mounds. And as I'm researching the mounds, I become aware of the Adena culture, this ancient culture that was that was there in that part of the world that was very concerned with re religious uh, rituals surrounding these mounds. And I'm thinking, wow, Charlie grew up playing on these mounds, you know, playing on the remains of the civilization. Mounds that were used either for burial or they were used for religious purposes, you know, aimed at the stars or whatever. Yeah. And I, I'm crawling over these mounds myself. And I'm saying, what is this all about? And then I notice there's this strange house. It's a huge brick house. And on the top of the house, there are these two Keruvim. There's two uh, cherubs, you know, like you find on top of the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> right. And these, these are on top of the roof of this house. And I'm thinking, well, that's bizarre. And they're really weird looking eldritch sort of figures you know mm -hmm. they're griffins or something and they're they're very strange and they're positioned like they would have been on the ark of the covenant and the, the two angels on the ark are the mercy seat god was supposed to come down and sit in the middle of that and i'm thinking well, let me research this a bit more and evidently they moved this house entirely the entire vast house this is not a small building 
This was a big apartment house when I was there. They moved the entire thing so that it would be kind of in line with these burial mounds. And I'm thinking, how weird is this? This is Ashland, Kentucky. <laughs> this is Chuck Woolery's hometown. This is Naomi Judd's hometown. You know? yeah, yeah. I mean, what what is this all about? And, you know, that started me off on this whole thing. What are the mounds about? What is what is the association? And then I found that there were mounds involved uh, underneath some of our, our biggest prisons in the Midwest. Uh, in Moundsville, West Virginia is where Squeaky from me was you know, one of Manson family's uh, members, her most prominent member, perhaps after the the ones who were arrested. She was arrested for the attempted assassination of Gerald Ford, Squeaky, and she wound up in a you know in a prison on top of one of the other mounds. Um, uh, Henry Lee Lucas, very famous killer, uh, was incarcerated uh, in Chillicothe, Ohio, on top of another burial mound. There was this association of burial mounds with with prisons in American consciousness somehow we we did that whether deliberately or accidentally so i began to wonder what is the meaning of this are we you know are is america as i say in sinister forces is it a haunted house are we living in a haunted house are there ghosts here in a sense from civilizations long past that we've been ignoring and could that be you know an element of our of our consciousness as human beings are we in a sense kind of possessed or haunted by these ancient um civilizations that we've basically trashed Mm hmm. Yeah, it's a really fascinating study with a lot of connections that I'd never heard before. And it, it, it does make you think because you like you say in the book, Native Americans, there's an area of West Virginia where they have legends don't go there. You know, this area yeah. where uh, the Mothman flare up happened. And it exactly. makes you think about spirits and entities and uh, maybe a subtle possession uh, of sorts. And yeah, it's it's very trippy, but maybe we're not as in control as we always think we are. No, I think we're in control, you know, of some of the things that we do, but I think our motivations are quite often unconscious, that we don't know why we're doing the things that we do, mm. you know, and I think that's part of the problem. We don't know why. We don't have a connection to this land, to this territory, the way people in other countries, you know, have connection to their territory. They identify with their land, with their landmarks, with their history going back hundreds, thousands of years. We are a, a, trans, a transient population, basically. We've come from everywhere with no direct connection to our land, to the territory we're living in. Yeah. Um, the people who lived here before, we've basically slaughtered as much as we could, or they existed and dropped out of sight even before the Native American populations, as we know them, showed up. So there's something going on here. We're not as connected. We're kind of adrift on this landscape. And our only points of tension sometimes are these weird bizarre architectural uh, geographical phenomena that we we don't know anything about that we just build our houses on top of we unconsciously kind of understand this if we look at american filmmaking over the last 20 30 years there's this idea that we build houses on indian burial grounds yeah you know right. it was there in uh, in the shining a very good example or it was there in um, uh, poltergeist mm -hmm. you know pet cemetery the, yeah that's a, <laughs> there you go and uh, this other, the other film with uh, John Cusack, the one that, where the, all these different personalities are inhabiting this motel, there are these delusions constantly to an Indian burial ground, which is never discussed anymore in the film. You know, it just happens to be there. There's brochures in the motel saying, you know, this is uh, an Indian burial ground. I mm -hmm. think the film was called Identity. Yes. So it, there are this, there's this idea that there's a connection between the, the burial grounds and our weird behavior you know <laughs> and, uh, and and i think this is something that's really worth looking into it is it is and of course you know when you talk about the founders of america we we know a good chunk of them were freemasons and they have their own esoteric uh beliefs and and practices and then we start reading about their interest in alchemy and ceremonial magic and we've had people write huge books on the geomancy and occult symbolism of washington dc when you look at it, I mean, there's a lot missing in the official story here, wouldn't you say? Oh, definitely. You know, because we're talking about what uh, what uh, I think it was James Webb called rejected knowledge. Mm -hmm. And even though it's rejected, it was still there. We can say that, oh, there's nothing to alchemy that was superstition. But, you know, the governor of Connecticut in the 17th century had a huge library of alchemical works, more than 250 volumes. Mm -hmm on alchemy. You didn't even know there were that many books on alchemy, right? <laughs> right. but he had 250 books on it. Um, Cotton Mather, 
uh, who was present at the Salem witchcraft trials, was uh, was learned in alchemy. Uh, he had friends in the Royal Society who were alchemists. Uh, there was a lot of co correspondence going back and forth on this subject. Uh, of course, Isaac Newton was very involved in alchemy I mean, through all of his life. So it was part of being educated, was to be educated in these ideas. Um, we had alchemy, we had uh, governors, and we had people prominent in religion, religious life, and in political life in our country in the 17th and 18th centuries who were extremely involved with alchemy, but also with ideas like ceremonial magic, which, according to some authors, was not quite that different. Uh, Cornelius Agrippa, one of the most famous magicians who, who wrote uh, books of occult philosophy, the three books of occult philosophy, um, was a, wrote extensively about ceremonial magic. But what was not so well known was that he was also a practicing alchemist and an alchemical laboratory went with him wherever he went. Huh. So there's this crossover between alchemy as a kind of pseudoscience, the way it's described today as a forerunner to alchemy, which it was not. You know, alchemy had its own reason for being. It had its own character. It was a, a it's hard to say it was a spiritual practice the way we understand it today because we've compartmentalized so much information to the point where nothing's related to anything else <laughs> anymore. But to those people back in the Enlightenment era, everything was connected. Everything was an iteration of something else. You could use uh, religion to discuss science. You could use science to discuss religion. There was not that strong a demarcation between all of them. So alchemy then became, for me, because I've written about alchemy a lot recently, is, um, is a very scientific approach to the idea of consciousness. I mean, it was basically a consciousness science that said you have to use all the tools available to you as a human being to understand what reality is. And once you do that, you can cause change to occur in the material world. Mm. And that's what alchemy was about. It was about going backwards in space and time to the point where the universe was created and understanding that process and then bringing it forward. It's a very sophisticated approach to understanding reality. And we've kind of thrown it out because it's not it's not chemistry, you know, it's not, <laughs> yeah. it's not physics, but it, it was chemistry, physics, biology, and a lot of uh, spirituality, what you might call spirituality, psychobiology, let's call it, um, all mixed in together, a very, very um, advanced kind of, of knowledge. And we rejected it. Um, by the time of the 19th century was coming around, the only people who were focused on that would be people who were creating religious cults. You know, so you had uh, Joseph Smith, you know, also very involved in studying alchemy, the man who created the, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints of the Mormons. Uh, he was conducting rituals in New York, you know, basically using Agrippa's formulas, mm -hmm. magic circles, wands, you know, lamps, incense, the whole thing, trying to contact spiritual forces. And that was the origin of, you know, the Book of Mormon. So jump forward 100 years. And you have L. Ron Hubbard doing the same thing in the California desert uh, with Jack Parsons using the same rituals that Joseph Smith was using. Man. <laughs> so, I mean, this is American. The American religious experience has its roots in ceremonial magic. Yeah, it definitely does. And you see all these uh, allusions to it early on. But what do you think about these beliefs and traditions? Are they still intact among parts of the political elite in this country? Oh, I think they are. I mean, we have um, a kind of a problem in our country, the way we, we understand things. We know legally in the Constitution there is separation between church and state. That's a legal thing, right? Yeah. Where, where, where Congress can make no law affecting religion, right? So that's fine. But that doesn't mean that our politicians have no religion. You know, mm -hmm. our politicians, America is one of the most religious countries on the planet. And people don't realize that if you've traveled abroad a lot, if you travel to Europe, Europe is not a religious country. They have a lot of religious architecture. They've got a lot of churches and stuff like that. But the people themselves are basically not religious, right. not that religious, right? They're amazed at America and our obsession with religion <laughs> in this country. So you have politicians, politicians, you have political leaders who hold very strange beliefs and who don't talk about those beliefs, except in the most general way. Oh, I believe in Jesus or something just to make everybody happy. Yeah. But basically what they really believe is sometimes is very strange. And we're electing these people and putting them in, in positions of power where they may, you know, act in accordance with these very strange beliefs. I mean, Ronald Reagan, 
was one of them. You know, Reagan belonged to the same denomination, the same religious sect um, that Jim Jones belonged to, the, the guy who was responsible for Jonestown and the Guyanese massacre. Mm -hmm. They belonged to the same, you know, the same denomination. It was an apocalyptic denomination, an end of times focus that we're living in the end of times. The world's about to be destroyed. We're, you know, we're, we're a breath away from mutually assured destruction. <laughs> and we elect this guy as president of the United States who goes up against the Soviet Union. You know, in his heart of hearts, what was he thinking? Was he thinking, oh, hell, if the world ends, that's fine because that's the way Jesus wanted it? <laughs> yeah. Thanks uh, a lot. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. Can we vote on this by any way, by any chance? And this is, you know, we have this. It's, it's, it, those are the obvious examples, like, you know, Ronald Reagan and, and Jim Jones being co-religionists, you know, yeah. if you will. But, you know, there's other more subtle uh, ideas as well. And Freemasonry uh, is one of those things that, you know, exists everywhere in government. We have said so many pre uh, presidents who are Freemasons and not just, you know, minor level Freemasons, but high level ranking Freemasons. Gerald Ford, you know, being one of them just to bring him back up again. Right. Uh, here, here was a guy who was you know high up in the Masons. We've had senators and congressmen. And, you know, people will say, well, you know, it's like a boys club. Yeah, except that, you know, it's a boys club with magical rituals, <laughs> right. with ritual initiations. You know, and it's not the kind of initiation you might find at a hazing, you know, at a frat house someplace. This is some serious stuff. True. This is memorizing huge amounts of text that you have to recite. This is going through really spooky rituals. Just the first three degrees of Freemasonry alone are talking about, you know, sort of death and resurrection um, in, in a very spooky sort of ceremony. And then you start adding the other degrees on top of it, the Rosicrucian degrees and the Knights Templar degrees and all of this. And you are bringing in not only the, the consciousness altering rituals themselves, but you're bringing in a whole kind of weird history that connects um, that American politician with ancient Egypt, with the Temple of Solomon, with the Knights Templars who were you know, uh, suppressed by the Catholic Church and, and massacred with uh, the Rosicrucian Society, you're building a whole different real, um, um, history, frame of reference, historical frame of reference that is outside the mainstream, right. you know, that, that regular historians don't write about. They don't see a timeline connecting all of these events. Yeah. But that is exactly what a Freemason of those high degrees would have to, if not believe, they're, they've been exposed to it in a very emotionally charged way. Mm. Yeah, definitely a worthwhile thing to draw some attention to. And, you know, if we're going to talk about occult influences in early America, you had mentioned the Salem witch trials. They're worth a mention for several reasons. But talk to us about this saga and how it might be connected, actually, to the UFO phenomenon. Yeah, it is very strange, I think. Um, we were taught in school, or I was anyway, back in the 20th century, uh, back, you know, many decades ago. <laughs> Um, we were taught all the, you know, Salem witchcraft trials. It was hysteria. Um, it was like basically the McCarthy era, which was referred to, of course, as witch trials also. In the 1950s is when I was going to school. Sorry about that, but that's true. <laughs> and it was the time of the McCarthy era, right? So, you know, we were looking for communists. It was like looking for witches. It was the same thing. And believe me, I've gone through this a number of times already, and now we're, we're in a similar situation today. So in those days, it was communists on the one hand. You had Arthur Miller writing The Crucible you know, which was a, you know, a metaphor for what was going on. And we were taught that there were no witches in Salem, that this was all trumped up, that this was people getting hysterical and blaming each other for things and a bunch of teenage girls going nuts and there was nothing to it at all. Mm -hmm. Well, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, there was witchcraft in Salem. There was alchemy. There was ceremonial magic throughout Massachusetts and, and, uh, Rhode Island, the Providence plantations and all of that, all the way going to Connecticut. There were practices of that nature. We're pretty sure that at least one or two of those accused in Salem were actually practicing occultists of some kind. That's what modern uh, scholarship has, has demonstrated. Wow. There is sufficient evidence that there was witchcraft going on there. Now, whether Tichuba, the, uh, the slave, was actually involved in it or not is a different story. There was two different streams or, or currents of occult um, practice taking place in that part of the world. One was the European-centered occult practices that we already talked about, ceremonial magic, Agrippa, alchemy, and all of that. And then there was what Tichuba represented, 
which was a kind of native um, Caribbean type of magical practice. So you had two streams running, and they kind of collided in Salem. Tichuba, when I was a kid in school, they kind of made Tichuba appear to be a, a black woman, you know, an African-American slave. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't. She was an Arawak Indian. She was from uh, a, a, the Native American race. She was enslaved down there in the Caribbean. She was bought by one of the, the people, the minister who was running Salem, uh, the Salem Church at that time, and brought up to uh, to Massachusetts. Um, that's a weird connection right there. There weren't that many Arawak left. You know, they had been slaughtered for the most part after Columbus uh, when there were uprisings and all of that, and the Arawak were gone after uh, very viciously by the Spanish uh, uh, in that part of the world, by the conquistadores. So you didn't have many Arawak left, but the Tichuba seems to have been one of them. There's been some good scholarship on that. Mm-hmm. And it seems as though her ethnic origins go back to Guyana, which, of course, is where we have the, you know, the Jonestown massacre a little bit later. <laughs> Um, so I'm not saying there's a direct connection, but it's a very suggestive one. Right. Uh, I call it Tichuba's revenge, you know. Um, but anyway, so, or, or maybe it's cigarette smoking is because that was an Arawak thing too. But, but Tichuba then is in Salem and when she's being questioned, and remember Tichuba started all of this, right? It was Tichuba's, uh, talking about voodoo dolls, right? Making puppets to affect other people through sympathetic magic that supposedly started this whole Salem thing. Uh, Tichuba was not executed at Salem. She lived a long life after Salem. She was thrown in prison. She was eventually released when the governor of Massachusetts uh, got you know, disgusted with the whole thing and said, enough is enough because now you've claimed my wife is a witch. Okay, we've gone far enough <laughs> here, boys and girls. Uh, so she was released, actually. I think she got married and you know went on her merry way, which is one of the things we don't hear about Tichuba. But when she was being interrogated, and she was being interrogated about um, how she went to the meetings of the witches, um, the the kind of occult rituals they would perform and all the rest of it, she kept referring to the man in black. It would be the man in black who would come to fetch her. The man in black was the messenger. He was the person who uh, brought people to the, the, the witchcraft ceremony, such as they were whether they were Sabbaths or Esbats or however they defined them in those days. Uh, Tichuba claimed it was the men in black who were doing this. Um, and it, I was startled to find that reference in a document you know, going back to 1692. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very bizarre. It is. And But there she is talking about the men in black, 1692, 1697, up to that point of time. And, you know, the, the idea of witches flying through the air, uh, the idea that they could, you know, dematerialize in one place, materialize someplace else, uh, sort of a manifestation of quantum entanglement <laughs> somehow, you know, mm-hmm. or non-locality. Uh, she's, these very sophisticated ideas are coming out of Tichuba. And the man in black, you know, motif then would be forgotten for maybe 200 years or almost 300 years uh, after Tichuba and it would only reappear again in the 1940s, 1950s, where the men in black then suddenly show up around the time of UFO experiences and they're there to, sh- they dress in black, they show up, they question, you know, witnesses, and they disappear. And they're always a little bit out of sync with everyone else. They're, lo- they're, they're driving cars that are, you know, 20, 30 years older than, you know, modern vehicles, and they're, they're dressed oddly and all the rest of it. Right. And Tichuba declared that these men in black would dress oddly. They were in black clothes, but they were not period uh, clothes of that period. I mean, there was, there was enough information there that led me to believe that maybe she was talking about something very real, that maybe there was a real experience behind Salem. Uh, academics will say, well, there were economic issues involved. There was this, you know, no, that's probably true, but there were, there was a triggering event. You know, there was something really deep behind it. Uh, the idea of spectral evidence, you know, where, uh, a girl could go hysterical in the courtroom and claim to see a devil, you know, uh, bothering somebody or, hmm. or possessing someone else. And of course, it, you know, no one else saw it. Uh, Cotton Mather himself eventually got disgusted with the whole thing and said, this is wrong. And Cotton Mather was, you know, was quite a conservative Christian, let us say. But when it came to the Salem witch trials, even three, he threw up his hands and said, it's not real. But nobody said that Tichuba was lying. No one claimed, nobody claimed that Tichuba had made anything up. The girls, yes, probably, you know, for the most part. 
But there were some people who were arrested at Salem who were involved in occult practices, and of that we know now to be true. Therefore, did these occult practices involve things that we would consider today to be UFO related? Yeah. Another interesting parallel is uh, bruises and marks on the body. That jives with the UFO abduction phenomenon, too. I found that pretty interesting. Oh, sure. Absolutely. There was, you know, the idea that there might have been implants, there might have been uh, body parts or, you know, uh, surgeries taking place on on people. Um, There was definitely this, there's a motif that runs through history. And it didn't start at Salem. It started, of course, much, much earlier on. But we see this motif everywhere. We see it in the, in the sacrifices of the Aztecs in Mexico. We see this concept that your organs are not really your own, that they belong to the gods. Hmm. And the gods can come and collect them at any time. And therefore, to forestall the gods coming back and wreaking havoc, we're going to select our own sacrifices. We're going to kill people and offer up their organs to the gods, which keeps you know the gods away from the rest of us. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research on that lately, um, and I'm reading deeply into the Aztec uh, uh, annals and the, the Popol Vuh and everything else coming around from the Maya and even the Inca uh, records. And if you look at it from the point of view that this could be part of that same phenomenon, then suddenly it all starts to make sense. You know, there's a there's a there's a recurring motif throughout world literature that seems to be that our blood is not our own, that our organs are not our own, that we ourselves are are not our own. We don't actually own ourselves. We're not as autonomous as we think we are. Um, and what is the reason for that? Why do we think that? Why do so many cultures have that belief? You know. Hmm. And in the Aztec case, they they were terrified by this. They were. I mean, people would willingly, voluntarily offer up their blood. You know, to to various shrines. They would pass a shrine on the road to an Aztec god, and they would open their veins. You know, and offer some of their blood to that shrine before going on. This was the concept they had. And to me, that's fascinating from the point of view of genetics and evolution. What does this all mean? Is there a genetic connection to this? You know, yeah. and what is it? So that's kind of the work I've been doing these days. Mm, that is an interesting thread, too. But yeah, so many flare ups throughout history. It becomes more and more apparent we might just be playthings for the gods, playthings for these sinister forces. And, um, I'm really interested in uh, the belief systems of the elite, their experiences with ceremonial magic, and really just how much contact with otherworldly entities there could be and how that influence could spread across the culture. So the story of the Nine is really amazing. It's probably the best example that there is meat on those bones, and you cover it so well. Can you tell us a little bit more about this farmhouse seance and some of the (laughs) elite families that were there? It sounds pretty weird when you put it that way, doesn't it? (laughs) It does. That old farmhouse seance. Um, you had this sort of American Gothic idea of a couple of people in overalls and a pitchfork. But actually, it was totally different. Um, and it is, I think, the best example of this. And a man called Andrea Puharic wrote about it very famously. I mean, he, he was not bashful about talking about this. That's why it's so well documented. And yet nobody put the two and two together. Um, Andrea Poharic uh, was a uh, American-born uh, scientist of Yugoslav uh, background. Uh, he was a medical doctor. He was an entrepreneur. He experimented with with um, scientific devices and that sort of thing. And during the Korean War, uh, he was, I believe, he had the rank of major in the U.S. Army. But he was based out of Edgewood Arsenal um, in Maryland, which was, of course, where the chemical biological warfare stuff was conducted. And he gave a talk. Uh, to the military, to the Defense Department personnel on weaponizing uh, psychic abilities. This is like, this is totally documented. It's, it's there. <laughs> we have names, addresses, and phone numbers. You know, he went there and gave that, that talk. He was very much um, involved in the study of paranormal phenomena. And he was a, a friend of Henry Wallace, who at one point was vice president of the United States, secretary of agriculture under Roosevelt. Um, Henry Wallace, of course, was a friend of Nicholas Rorick, who was the famous Russian psychic and artist and medium who, you know, went on vast travels through Tibet and Asia and places like that, um, and who had actually seen a UFO back in the 1920s or 1930s, I believe. Hmm. So this Andrea Poharic, um, as I say, was fascinated with the paranormal, fascinated with psychic abilities. 
And he gathered around himself a group of, of friends and, and, and fellow travelers, you might say, that he called the Round Table Foundation. And he had a seance. This was in, in 1952. Remember, 1952 was the year of the great UFO overflight in Washington, D.C. in July of that year. Well, a little later on, Kuharich has the seance. And the person who was the medium was a Dr. Vinod uh, from India, who was a very prominent, actually, member of some of the world religious organizations. And I was in contact with the family a few years ago because I was desperately trying to find out more about this guy. And they were insisting he wasn't a medium at all, but he was very religious. Uh, for some reason, he acted as a medium with Puharaj. And as a medium, he had conducted the seance to which a very strict um, number of people was invited. And the people who were invited involved Arthur Young, who was the, the uh, one of the, dis the inventors of the Bell helicopter uh, during World War II. After the war, he dropped out of the engineering business and went straight into full-time research on the paranormal. Arthur Young and his wife. His wife is Ruth Forbes Payne Young, which is a lot of nomenclature there, but I'll explain that in a bit. Mm -hmm. Also, there was a DuPont and an Astor, members of the DuPont family and the Astor family. We had basically a blue blood American royalty sitting around a seance table, you know, <laughs> in the forest in Maine. And they were allegedly, according to Puharich himself, they were contacted by a group calling itself the Nine that was evidently living on a spaceship hovering over the planet. And they were proving their, um, their existence and their, their intelligence by solving a mathematical equation for Puharaj, which he later verified was true. And then they went on to discuss, you know, plans for the planet, how the, you know, the people have to get together and solve some of these problems. And that the nine people sitting at that table were the nine who were just like them called the nine. There were nine astral entities or whatever you want to call them, extraterrestrials. And there were nine humans and those nine and the nine on the ground were now united. They were linked. And the nine people on the ground should go out and, you know, conduct themselves accordingly and cause change to occur in the world in general. Damn. They had their marching orders from this spacecraft entity speaking through an Indian medium. Um, and they took this seriously. Okay. This was a very serious thing that they did. Um, Arthur Young and his wife, of course, for the rest of their lives were involved in paranormal research. Um, Arthur Young wrote a number of books. He understood that beyond the scientific ideas that, uh, of the time, there was one that was neglected, which was the scientific idea of the process, the process of how things happen. He had a seven-stage process a formula that he used. He wrote The Geometry of Meaning. He wrote The Theory of Process. He was very involved in that, kind of combining you know, metaphysical ideas with science. That was Arthur Young's forte. Um, one of the DuPonts uh, became very prominent in other uh, uh, psychological and spiritual organizations. The Astor herself uh, was related to the, to the famous Astor family, the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, she had a lot of connections to occultism and occult practices also. And the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. That's 1952. Arthur Young, as I said, is married to Ruth Forbes Payne Young. That's because Forbes was her maiden name. This is the same family that gave us uh, John Kerry, right? Uh, this is this is the, For the Forbes, uh, you know, uh, Forbes magazine. It's the same Forbes family. Right. This uh, this famous uh, wealthy, influential family. She's part of that. She married a guy called George Lyman Payne, who was a Trotskyite uh, out of California. She divorced him and then married Arthur Young. But she had had a son by her previous marriage to, to George Payne, and that was Michael Payne. Now, Michael Payne got a job through Arthur Young working for Bell Aerospace in Texas um, because Arthur Young still had tremendous connections at Bell. So now Michael Payne, who was kind of a, seems kind of a lazy ne'er-do-well mostly, gets this kind of cushy job down in Texas, hmm. in Dallas. And he's married to another Ruth. He's married to Ruth Payne. And Ruth Payne um, wanted to study Russian. She was a Quaker. She studied folk dancing. She was like into a lot of different things. And at one point, she was introduced 
to Lee Harvey Oswald and Marina Oswald. Uh, introduced by George Damore and Shield. Now, all of you Kennedy researchers know exactly who I'm talking about in this in this discussion. Um, Ruth Payne opened her home to the Oswalds. Marina Oswald lived with Ruth Payne for a while. The idea is Ruth would teach her Russian. That you know, for some reason, Ruth Payne was desperate to learn Russian, um, which was an uncommon language to be obsessed about in 1963. And at any rate, so there you know, she's living there with the kids and everything else, and. Ruth Payne is the one who helps Lee get his job at the Texas School Book Depository. Wow. Ruth is also the one who basically gives all the evidence necessary to hang Lee Harvey Oswald to the Dallas police. You know, she has stuff in her garage that belongs to Lee, and she she gives him up, basically. They are members of the ACLU, He, uh, she and his her husband, Michael Payne. They don't arrange for a lawyer for Lee Oswald, even though Lee is asking for a lawyer in one of his television things when he was after he was arrested. They don't bother to move an inch to get him a lawyer. Um, and later, of course, there's a famous photograph of Marina Oswald, Marguerite Oswald, Lee's mother, and Ruth Payne sitting in Ruth Payne's home, you know, with the with the Dallas police and the FBI. And they're, you know, spilling their guts basically on this whole thing. A month, no, but two months before the assassination, Ruth Payne out of Texas goes on vacation, and she goes up to Philadelphia and hangs out with Arthur Young and uh, his his wife, Ruth. We don't know what was discussed. Hmm. We don't know what she was. She had a Russian defector living in her house, right? <laughs> right? How many Americans had Russian defectors living in their house in 1963? I can tell you probably, you know, 10 or less <laughs> or three, right? So this is like amazing, right? She yeah. has a Russian defector. You know they talked about this. Mm-hmm. You know, you know this was an object of discussion. After the assassination, Ruth Payne, out of Dallas, Irving, Texas, technically, is called in front of the Warren Commission to give her testimony because she's a crucial person in all of this. I read through all of her testimony. In the very first interview she's doing in front of the Warren people, the Warren Commission, who's on the Warren Commission? Alan Dulles, right? Former head of the CIA. Mm -hmm. Alan Dulles is sitting there, probably smoking his pipe during the whole thing. Hmm. Ruth Payne starts to talk about her trip up to Philadelphia to meet Arthur Young. Alan Dulles cuts her off immediately. If you read the transcript, it's obvious. She's starting to talk about this trip. He cuts her off. He makes a few jokes, and he totally sidetracks the entire conversation. We never hear about her trip to Philadelphia. We never hear Arthur Young mentioned. We never hear what she was doing up there. We never hear what, what was discussed. Alan Dulles made sure of that. Wow. Why was this so? Well, as it turns out, Arthur Young's wife, Ruth Young, her best friend was Alan Dulles's mistress. <laughs> Known her for years. They were best friends together for a long time. Dulles knew what was going on in the Arthur Young household. You know? There yeah. couldn't have been no doubt about that he knew something really explosive was involved here, and he made sure that Ruth uh, Ruth Payne did not discuss it in front of the Warren Commission, and she never did, and she hasn't since. She has not discussed what happened during that vacation to visit Arthur Young, what she discussed about Lee and Marina, and how she came back down, got Lee the job at the Texas School Book Depository, and the rest is history. But here was the nine in operation, you know. Uh, it's such a fascinating connection, and so many people have studied the JFK conspiracy, and you very rarely hear about this uh, really interesting connection with the Nine. And if these people were supposed to be kind of soldiers of the these entities' agendas, do we see the threads go out to any other events besides uh, this interesting connection to the JFK thing? Well, I mean, the JFK has more connections back to the Nine, actually, which are also you know completely unbelievable. I mean. Just the, the, the fact that George DeMorenschild um, was a friend of one of the famous mushroom scientists, uh, a guy called Wasson, uh, yeah. who was on, on the trail of the magic mushroom in Mexico. Um, he was, Wasson was reporting back specifically and directly to Andrea Puharich, the leader of the mine, um, on his, you know, on the experiments that he was doing in Mexico with the mushrooms. In fact, he was supposed to be conducting psychic 
uh, telekinesis, uh, telekinesis and psycho uh, ESP, you know, uh, experiments uh, during his time in Mexico uh, back to Andrea Puharich, who was then still in Maine. There was supposed to be this, this conversation going back and forth telepathically or something, which Wasson screwed up because he got totally stoned on mushrooms, <laughs> um, which is understandable, I guess. Right. But anyway, so Wasson goes back and, you know, this whole idea of psychedelic mushrooms, of psilocybin and all of this becomes a major issue. He has a full page, you know, photographic spread in Life magazine and all of this. Wasson becomes the guru of magic mushrooms. His name, address, phone number was in George de Morinchild's address book when he committed suicide, when he was being uh, getting ready to testify in front of the, the House Subcommittee on Assassinations, right? So evidently, according to the story, he committed suicide with a shotgun, and they found his address book and Wasson's name was in it, which indicates a connection back to the Nine with de Morinchild, who also, of course, was involved in some kind of a confidential informant for CIA and, and everything else. And most recently, uh, in the Hitler legacy, I talk about this. I, I found this very strange coincidence as well that, um, Demar and Schilt, when he was in Yugoslavia, uh, in the 1950s, uh, was accused of spying for American intelligence, but he was there under, uh, the aegis of the forerunner of the U.S. AID program, which was a strange little operation, uh, that was created by John Foster Dulles, which was supposedly an international aid operation operating uh, out of the State Department, but which functioned as a front for CIA or, or intelligence activities in other parts of the world. Uh, George DeMore and Schultz was involved with that. Um, and it seems as though there were connections back to Oswald, uh, connections back to a couple of other very unsavory people that I, that I researched in Asia, who were also part of the same operation. So there's a lot of very strange stuff going on there. But then there's the other coincidence, the one that I, I couldn't believe, really, when I came across it. And I had to read it a few times to think maybe I was seeing things or imagining things. And I wasn't. It doesn't make sense even to this day if we think in purely linear terms um, where space-time is concerned. Mm -hmm. And that is that there was a Belgian mystic who won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Oh, 100 years ago. And his name was uh, Maeterlinck, Maurice Maeterlinck. Uh, he wrote a number of, of novels. He wrote plays. He was involved with Stanislavski in, in Moscow. Uh, Stanislavski, of course, invented the famous method of method acting. Um, and he wrote a play called uh, uh, um, The Cloud That Lifted. It's a play that's probably never been performed in the United States, or maybe it was once or something. It was not one of his most popular plays. Um, and in The Cloud That Lifted, he writes about the assassination of a political leader, uh, about the number of shots that were fired, which nobody could really recall how many bullets were actually fired. The bullets were fired from a grassy knoll in front of this political leader. And it was fired by a guy whose name was Alec and who might have been working for Russia. Hmm. All of these details are in a play that was published before John F. Kennedy was even born. Wow. It prefigured the entire assassination, even to the point that Alec is mentioned because Alec Hiddell was Lee Harvey Oswald's alias. That's how he bought the rifle that he allegedly used to shoot the president. He was Alec and he was called Alec in Russia when he was a defector living in Russia. <laughs> so the whole thing is prefigured in this play, written by a guy who was a mystic, by the way, who believed in astrology and mysticism and seances and all the rest of it, uh, and won the Nobel Prize to boot. Here was a guy who also wrote a play about the bluebird of happiness. You know, this idea of the bluebird of happiness, this, this concept comes from him. And in his play, which is really strange, and they did make a film out of that with... Um, with Jane Fonda, among other people, there was this, you know, there were these kids and they're going on a, a trip to find the bluebird of happiness. They're going through the forest and they're encountering all sorts of strange people. But the idea of political conspiracy is in this story. The idea of mind control, of altering reality is all there. And then, of course, we have Operation Bluebird, which was the beginning of the United States mind control, MK Ultra style uh, experiments on, you know, behavior control, mind control brainwashing and all the rest of it. 
it was called Bluebird. I think that's quite deliberate. I think it was a, a deliberate reference to the Maeterlinck play. And if that is so, did they also use the cloud that lifted as a template for the assassination of the president? Man, yeah, that is so weird. And we do see it time and time again. Also with that story you mentioned at the beginning of the show, these strange syncs between media and art and real life events. Another case of it would be with the sinking of the Titanic and the book that was written earlier about the Titan. Yep. I mean, the story is almost the same in the name, the Titan. You couldn't really get much closer. Sure. And I know we're getting down to the wire here. Another thing I'm curious about, and I know better than to flat out ask you about your own experiences with ceremonial magic or rituals or the Necronomicon, but you have talked about paranormal experiences as a teenager that validated there being something else in the world. Is there any advice you can give to listeners who are interested and accept these kind of ideas intellectually, but haven't ever interacted with it on a personal level? Any thoughts on how to best coax out an interaction of some type? Wow. Uh, let me think for a second. Sure. Um, the, the importance is this. I think Israel Regardi, who was another one of Crowley's uh, 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 subjects, you might say, one of the people who worked with Crowley a great deal, had this to say. He said that um, before you embark on a program like this, it's good to spend a couple of years in therapy uh, <laughs> first. Uh, and there's a reason for that. He wasn't being glib. He actually meant it. And he meant it because you don't know what your motivations are for wanting to experience the paranormal. And you don't know what your vulnerabilities are. You don't know what might happen uh, if you have an experience that is so far outside the realm of the norm that it could you know, conceivably unhinge you, could make you a little crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's very good advice. I think people who are drawn to the subject might be drawn to it for some of the wrong reasons. And wrong is, is, is a judgmental word. That's not really the way I want to put it, put it out there, but it could be because of a vulnerability in your own psyche that you're trying to redress uh, without really knowing about it. This is very potent, uh, emotional and psychological material, or it can be. Um, in, in fact, in the best way it can be, but it means that you're going to be taking risks and playing a little bit fast and loose with your own consciousness. And if you're not really strong, psychologically, it could be enough to tip you over a moment. You could become obsessive. Uh, there have been, even Crowley writes about cases where people have become obsessive uh, by studying magic and all kinds of wrong things have happened. Um, I've known people, you know, that that's happened to. Hmm. That they get involved in this thing and they think that suddenly they have the secrets to the universe, but at the same time they're being pursued by, you know, faceless demons who want to eat them. <laughs> um, and, you know, that does exist in a, in a theoretical sense. But it can be handled, it can be dealt with. But when the fear reactions start to take over, then you lose objectivity and you lose power over your own mind. And that's the thing you really want to avoid. Um, I think it's, I think it's something you go into gradually. Mm -hmm. I was a kid when this happened. There was no idea of, you know, of going into anything gradually when you're, when you're a kid, when you're a teenager. Right. And so you just sort of go, go into it and you don't know, you had no teachers, you had nobody to tell you what to do. And you, know, you have these experiences. And in a sense, I wish I didn't have them. If I had not had them, I probably would have led a pretty normal life up till now. <laughs> but it was having them while I was in high school and then going into high school and studying chemistry and biology and physics, you know, in a high school academic program and realizing the two things didn't match. That basically made me question everything and questioning everything. Is not a comfortable place to be if you want to progress in society. You know, right, you've right. got to buy into a program and stick with it, right? Um, you've got to become an insurance salesman, or something. <laughs> and and that was that door was closed to me once I had these experiences. As much as I try to ignore them at some times and forget about them, it was still there. I saw things that should not happen, that should not really exist, and that is what led me into understanding there were secrets and there were other people like me who might have had the same experiences or something similar, who then pursued this study much more aggressively than I did, and maybe in a different context, maybe in a military context or a political one or, or a scientific one. So it made me realize that there are people out there with some shared experiences who look at the world in a different way. And do we, oh, should we be afraid of these people? You know, and I'm still not 100% sure on that, and I can't give you an ultimate answer. Hmm. We should be afraid of some of them. Yeah, probably. You know, yeah. and some of them, some of them, maybe not, but some of them, yeah, I think so. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, definitely good points. I'm super interested, but until you've had like a personal experience, it's hard to fully pull these things out of mythology and superstition. Sure. And that's definitely why I'm why I'm curious, but you're right. Who who knows the deeper deep down reason I might be curious somewhere in the back of my mind I might be being uh subtly possessed into developing an interest. <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go. Who, who knows? But, but, it, but it could be a very human interest. I mean, this is part of who we are. Remember Julian Jaynes wrote a book called The Bicameral, about the bicameral mind uh, a long time ago. Perhaps you don't remember. It's, uh, it was very big in the time, at the time, mm. very controversial. And he said that, you know, consciousness, human consciousness developed when we learned to shut off one half of our brain. That at one point, as we evolved as hominids, the two halves of the brain were having a conversation. And one half of our brain was the half that we thought we were listening to God talk, right? Yeah. Telling us to do this and to do that. And eventually with evolution, we shut down that part of the brain or we integrated it so much that we no longer hear it. So it was a kind of schizophrenia wow. that you know, the human race lived in a state of schizophrenia for a long time, which is why we never progressed, you know, until we learned to shut down one half of the brain that we could concentrate on other things. So it's pop, probably hardwired into us, this listening to the voices of angels and gods and seeing visions and all the rest of it, which is what one half of our brain does. You know, we've learned to sort of channel it into art or, or something else, but that wasn't a complete cure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that didn't solve the problem completely. And those of us who are very much involved, you know, in the arts and in creative work may have inadvertently opened those channels, which is what Lovecraft was writing about. Wow. Yeah. I, I love that perspective. And with these things, of course, you're right. It's important to approach with caution. We do we do hear a lot of horror stories. Same with psychedelics, really. I mean, some people consider them to be enlightening versus mind melting. You know, some people never come back. They just become burnouts from the same chemicals that other people attribute to wisdom and enlightenment. Sure. And that, an example of that that we really didn't get to, to talk about is MK Ultra. And I like how you consider that time period, the things that were going on under that umbrella as forced ritual initiation. I never considered it that way, but it really was forced initiation without the safeguards and in complete ignorance in a lot of cases. Precisely. Uh. And then we sent those people out onto the street. Yeah. <laughs> Man. And we wonder why, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and that has all kinds of threads too. But wow, this has been amazing, man. You are such a wealth of information and you've written about so much that it, it's tough to even scratch the surface here. We didn't even talk about wandering bishops, but hopefully no. we can do this again sometime, you know? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. Awesome. And uh, before I really cut you loose, can you remind the people about some of your books they can pick up, your website, anything else you're working on? Sure, you can go. I have a, a website, peterlavenda.com. I don't update it that often. I'm deeply involved in a big project right now that uh, I have to finish uh, as soon as I can. And it's extremely, it's like another Sinister Forces project, basically. So um, I don't update the stuff as much as I could. But you can get information on uh, peterlavenda.com. When well, Amazon, of course, has all the books. I mean, it has the Nazi books, uh, the, the Dark Lord, which is the, um, the Kenneth Grant book that you mentioned, as well as other books I've written on Freemasons and on the Mormons and, and other things as well. So it's all there. Uh, I've written books on Tantra. I just came out with a book called The Tantric Alchemist, uh, which is an investigation of alchemy and basically decoding European alchemical texts in light of psychobiology and, and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of stuff I've been working on. Uh, and my last name is spelled Levenda, L-E-V-E-N-D-A. People will spell it L-A and get totally confused when they find some other guy. So I uh, <laughs> just thought I'd, I'd reiterate that. But sure. Yeah, my books are on, on, of course, on Amazon, all the usual suspects, Barnes and Noble, and places like that. Right on. Awesome stuff, man. I really enjoyed it. And as a lazy stoner and college dropout, I have so much respect for you <laughs> and all the research you've done. You're, you're one of the greats, man. Take care of yourself out there. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. You got it. Wow, guys. Peter Lavenda, very knowledgeable, well-spoken guy, and he's got some elements of mystery to him as well. It's really no secret that some people suggest Peter is really Simon of the Necronomicon. He even has a disclaimer about it on his website, and I've heard him say he knows who Simon is, but it isn't him. And either way, I love it, and I consider this show to be really top of its class. And the Sinister Forces trilogy is really awesome. Kudos to Gordon White for pushing me to dig deeper into those books. Maybe he's working some magic on me, hijacking my motivations, but... 
I guess it worked out, so what can I really say about it? Peter really is a great writer all around, and I plan to complete a few more of his titles and have him on again, but getting that context for America's magical history was great, and the witch trials too, something you very rarely hear about. And in the book, he does mention the giants also, but we just couldn't fit it all in. If you did like the show, please give some love to Peter Lavenda, check out his stuff, let him know that there were people listening so we can get him back. We did cover so much ground from ancient America, Manson and the Mounds, rejected knowledge and alchemy within America's early founders, the Salem witch trials and the parallels with alien abduction, interesting justification for human sacrifices, and then of course in the second hour of the show for Plus members we got into Peter's work on the Nazis and the occult and their strange beliefs, lots of insights I hadn't heard from anyone else. We talked about the Hollow Earth, too, and a connection between Operation High Jump and the assassination of JFK. So many connections with this guy. And also, I figured, since I do see so many comments asking me, well, what about the Jewish elite every time a guest talks in depth about the Nazis, I figured I'd ask Peter about it. So we got into the idea that the Jews run the world, that whole conspiracy, Zionism, and how to kind of put these things in context with everything else we know, I'm glad we went there. I thought those were pretty good answers. And uh, we talked about Nazis in the Catholic Church, too. Connections between Lovecraft and Crowley, Kenneth Grant and the OTO, and a bunch of other stuff. I mean, you, you know the drill by now. Just sign up for the extended show already and treat yourself to the totality of THC. I think it's about time. Not only did I dig out some old Joey Diaz show as a bonus last week, I also did the first edition of the Carlwood q and I answered personal and conspiratorial questions from the forum thread and it went a little longer than an hour so check that out and ask me some questions for the next one if you're interested a lot of people seem to like it so i think they're going to continue and i do really just love the forum discussions i wanted to bring up one about the white genocide trend in the conspiracy community it kind of relates to today's show it's way too much to read but in the Make the case for forum where we try to stack up evidence for various perspectives. Shaman Janir pointed out a laundry list of areas where you can see Nazi influence after World War II. The fact that the Nuremberg trials only convicted a dozen or so Nazis and only 10 served sentences. Does that sound like a power structure dismantled and held accountable? It doesn't to me. He also brought up that the Muslim Brotherhood was who George Herbert Walker Bush reached out to for creating the Mujahideen, likely because of the family ties through Prescott Bush's Nazi connections. Then later, the Mujahideen were finally utilized again as Al-Qaeda and Gladio operations, which were then recently rebranded as ISIS. I mean, Nazi connections to ISIS. I see the thread there. He also brought up the Red House report, which outlines Nazi plans for post-war Germany's European domination by the establishment of the EU, as well as for Nazi survival, by leveraging their backers in Britain, America, and the Vatican, and by the smuggling of loot through Switzerland. I mean, that's Joseph Farrell talking about huge caches of Nazi loot. He also brings up, you know, who does Greece or any other European country have to placate when their currency is in crisis? Germany. And there's way more there. I'm very thankful to have people putting out really thoughtful and intelligent posts in the forums, but I point these things out just because I get annoyed when people want to reduce things down to a single narrative, I can be tempted to do it as well, and I definitely did it more in the past, but the more I see, the more complex things are. Not simple. And I would throw in the words of one more guy, Hammer1, who said, If you imagine fascists in Europe as the extension of the Roman Empire, the last 150 years in Europe starts to make a little more sense. Familiarizing oneself with the empire can be quite handy. Why would the Vatican work with the Nazis? Ever heard of the Holy Roman Empire? Based in what is now Germany? This is why all European royal families have very strong Germanic ties. The royal houses, the Vatican, and the Nazi party are all arms of the same octopus. The empire never fell is not the glib throwaway line that it appears to be. But like everything in this life, it seems to be a both and kind of thing. And that is spot on. That's my attitude. It's both. Drawing attention to one power center does not mean we're ignoring others. And I'm not saying there's not lies told about World War II also. I think there's a lot to be unpacked there, but I just don't think it goes so far as to think the Nazis were not also bad guys. There really was no good with World War II the way I see it. Just two power structures looking to feed. And when it comes to people broadly criticizing the Jews... 
it's just not descriptive enough, and it turns the majority of people off, and then they miss the core message, which might be about real substance. Because even if a large group of media and banking elites are Jewish, which I have no problem criticizing, you can't blame a whole race, can you? Just like you can't say all Americans are to blame for the military-industrial complex. I want nothing to do with that. Neither do a lot of people I know. Just because we share a race or a nationality, don't let that be the division. It's about regular people being manipulated and fed on by the ultra-rich. That's the division to me. It's very simple. So when shows go looking at refugees as the enemy, as the de destroyers of white culture, I mean, come on. Enough with the I only want white people within these borders. It just sounds so gross. As technology improves, as people's resources improve, our ability to move around the planet more freely becomes apparent. And maybe some brown people are going to come to your white place, but we're all going to be okay, I think. Maybe this has to do with me being an American rather than a European, because, like we talked about in the show, Americans don't have a cultural heritage or connection to the land we're on that's very old. We sort of have what I've been describing in private conversations lately as an individualized culture. We just take what we like and make it a part of us on an individual basis, and I love that. I think that's what culture and political ideologies and spirituality should be, individualized. Of course, you can do that anywhere, but I think Americans do it subconsciously because there isn't that long traditional heritage. But if I was born Mexican, I wouldn't want to feel obliged to like and know about Mexican music or adhere to Mexican stylistic choices. I'm actually heavily Polish and Swedish, and my attitude is, oh, that's interesting, and I just go about my life and try to enjoy it. I don't know much about the heritage there or the history of those places. I probably know more about the Japanese or the Egyptians because I was curious about their history, and so what? Are we not part of the human family first? So because I built my own cultural likes and dislikes and I'm just an individual, I don't fear anyone coming around and destroying my culture or affecting it in any way. I, I just don't care about that. I'm sure most Syrians would love to just be home with their families if their world hadn't been turned upside down by powers completely outside of their control. They're not flooding in to hurt you. They're just trying to exist. These terrorist extremists we know are just puppets for the shadowy elite, pawns being used on the chessboard to spread fear. And I just hear shows talk about loving everyone and how big a part of the playbook divide and conquer is, and then in the next breath they're worried about the Muslim invasion. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure people who are on this thread will say I'm naive and I don't understand the ramifications of this multi-generational campaign to destroy Europe with multiculturalism so everyone forgets their roots and we have this hodgepodge one-world government. But the existence of Chinatown does not destroy San Francisco. Whether they co-mingle or just coexist. It's not something to worry about. And again, I think the one world government is already established through corporations without borders and a revolving door of privileged fucks. I think Coke and Pepsi, McDonald's and Walmart have done more to destroy a culture than a mosque on the corner. Where's that outrage? Those are the companies destroying your local culture and heritage, aren't they? Replacing it with nutrient deficient cardboard and poison. Look, I'm not saying the elite aren't trying to force cultures to clash together. Just that, if you consider yourself part of the human family first, that play won't work against you. Now, I do think that cuts both ways, too. If I was talking to a devout Muslim who insisted on looking the part, I'd say just drop that traditional bullshit that you were raised in so you bought into it and just look around and decide what you like. Don't be attached to a paradigm that is being used as a weapon right now. Let go of that attachment. If you think flat bills look cool, wear a flat bill. If you like wallet chains, then wear your damn wallet chain. Can a South Korean not wear overalls and a plaid shirt just because they were born in the wrong South? I mean, I'm joking around, but that's just because I find this so silly. White people and white culture will still exist, even if we have to share the spotlight a little more than we have traditionally. Is that weird? I don't know. I just think the floodgates are open, the internet is here, and cross-contamination of culture is going to exist everywhere you look. And maybe I just don't get it. But you're only going to hear me criticize power structures, not multiculturalism fear-mongering. Maybe I'll be one of the last shows to be able to say that, for better or worse. But there are ways to criticize these things as campaigns of the elite without going overboard into paranoia territory. But what do I know? I am not the smartest man in the world. This is just a tribute. And with that, I am calling it in.
If you remember, I used to ask for tracks from listeners who might be in bands with related songs, and I stopped doing that because even though bands were giving me permission, I was still getting automated copyright strikes on YouTube, which defeated the whole purpose. But I do have this song laying around called Wiccan Wives from a band called The Wire Riots. I hope they still listen, but I thought it'd be an appropriate one to play us out with. So that's it for me this week. I hope you don't hate me too much for going against the grain of my own conspiratorial culture. But either way, it's your move, occult architects of our stagecrafted reality. Your frickin' move. <laughs>